Hi, welcome to the Sigma Pack. In this episode, I have another product review for you guys. We'll be taking a look at this Rodham Shores FPH Portable Spectrum Analyzer. And I'm really excited about this, not just because I like this unit, but also because this is the first Rodham Shores instrument that I'm reviewing on the Sigma Pack. So far, I've reviewed almost every vendor except for Rodham Shores and Anritsu. So I'm really excited to get my hands on this. And this is a German instrument, German company. I really like their stuff. They have some of the world's most advanced spectrum and network analyzer instruments and now they're also releasing more of their oscilloscopes which I'm quite eager to get my hands on. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what this guy can do. I want to give you an overview of how it compares with some of the other models they have to offer and also how it performs on its own. Now as with every review that I do, it's broken down into sections and there are timestamps depending on what part you want to see. There's tear down, there's experiments and so on. So I'm going to put that in the video description so you can watch the part that's of most interest to you. Oh, watch all of it. There's a lot of cool things to talk about. So let's get started. So let's take a quick look at the lineup of the signal and antenna analyzers that Roden Shorts has to offer. Now these are all the portable versions of these instruments broken into four categories. We have the ZPH, the ZVH, the FSH and the FPH series. Now the FPH being the one that I'm going to be reviewing today. And if you look carefully, the first three categories of instruments all have built-in signal generators. And you can tell that by the fact that they have two type N connectors. The FPH being the economical entry level model doesn't have that and this is a, a tactic by Roden Schwartz of course to get these into people's hands without really butchering the functionality and the feature set of their higher end models and also create a, a very economical version of these portable spectrum analyzers. Now the ZPH and the FPH as you can see share the same design philosophy. This is their new uh, design look and the GUI look which I really like and we'll take a look at it once we are going to look at the FPH closely. Now these are going to have a wide range of application, wide range of capabilities and of course quite a wide range of price. Now looking at the ZBH, this particular model can go all the way up to 4 GHz. These are all software unlockable, meaning that no matter which uh, frequency version you buy, you can always upgrade with the software. Now because it has a built-in generator, it can also do measurements such as DTF, return loss, VSWR, and so on. And this, this can also do a one-port cable loss measurement, very handy in the field if you're trying to find a fault or an un undesired loss somewhere in the system. Huge battery life, nine hours, more than a day's worth of work, and quite a, quite light actually for its functionality. Now this this is the reason why also the FPH has a quite a long battery life because they are uh, this is their new design of course. Now the ZVH and FSH are uh, still use the old look, but these guys are the ones that have the highest level of functionality. For example, the ZVH goes all the way up to eight gigahertz, and it has 100 dB of dynamic range, meaning that you could take this on the field and measure antenna isolation, diplexer problems, or if there is any a leakage or coupling that is undesired and you want to be able to find them on the field without having to bring the big instruments out, you can do that with 100 dB dynamic range. And these, these numbers are necessary in wireless applications when you're dealing with a huge amount of power leaving the station and very little power coming back. So this is quite normal and necessary. It also has a built-in DC power supply, so it, it makes it quite attractive for measuring unpowered amplifiers that you can directly power or provide a bias from the instrument itself on the go. Now, the battery life is, of course, quite a bit less, and this is the old design. I wonder if this has to do with the fact that they have improved the actual hardware, or it's just simply because this guy has much higher power consumption because of the frequency range as well as some of the other circuitry needed to get this performance out of it. Now the FSH is the probably the most famous and most common model, and it's the one that I repaired, a really older version of this I repaired in my lab a while ago. And these guys can go all the way up to 20 gigahertz. They have very high sensitivity, 141 minus 161 with the preamplifier, and it's the only one of this series that actually has a demodulation capability. So it has a 20 20 megahertz analysis window and therefore it can analyze LTE signals on live on the field uh, for issues or problems and or any other type of modulation that you want to analyze. So 20 megahertz is, is pretty nice. I wish the, the newer models also had this uh, but um, I don't believe that they do so this is something that's reserved for the high-end model there. And of course because it has internal tracking generators it can do all the other measurements that you would expect with a tracking generator. It also can behave as a full two-port network analyzer which is fantastic obviously going to cost 
quite a bit more and it has a ruggedized flash proof design there and uh, that the battery life for this but I couldn't immediately find obviously it's going to vary depending on the options and what the frequency ranges and what is uh, equipped with but anyway the uh, FPH that we're going to look at today it has a still a pretty good RF performance with the preamplifier not as we said the FSH but it's very respectable and it can go all the way up to 4 gigahertz so we're going to be looking at the 4 gigahertz model here which has been upgraded with the key of course and it has a whole bunch of different uh, software options for different types of uh, industries you know defense and wireless industries and so on and we'll take a look at a little bit of that as well but I wanted to give you an overview of these different instruments so you know what we're looking at and how it compares with everything else I would have loved to review for example um, something when the if they upgrade the FSH to the new look and feel that would be an awesome instrument to to have in the lab and play around with but uh, for the moment Let's take a look at the affordable FPH and see what it can do. And here is the Rodenschroff Spectrum Rider FPH and look at it. It is a really beautiful and wonderfully designed instrument. I really like the way it looks and the, the design of it and just it just catches your attention right away. Now unlike a lot of portable devices and spectrum analyzers from other vendors, that claim to be field use friendly. I have to say that the engineers who designed this one actually have been to the field and they recognize the difficulties associated with using these things on the go. For example, the buttons are huge and they're all backlit, easily accessible and used when you're wearing gloves, which is very common when you're outside uh, working on uh, towers and antennas and so on and you want to be able to easily access it. You don't want to keep taking your glove off. Even the rotary knob here has little spikes on it that catch your glove when you're using it outside. So this is really well thought out. The screen is huge. It is non-reflective at all, which is thank goodness for that. I, I really don't like reflective LCD screens. Multi-touch capacitive support, of course, which if you have a glove that's compatible with that, you would be able to use. Uh, the screen is 800 by 480 uh, pixel resolution, which could be a little bit more. I feel like it's uh, lacking from the resolution point of view, but it definitely does the job for the purposes of this instrument itself. And it's built like a tank. I mean, this thing is, is solid, as with all of Rodenshore's um, instruments are designed definitely to last. And let me just show you a comparison here, just so you can get an idea of the size. Here it is compared to, for example, the Fluke 199C. So you can see how much larger it actually is, how much, how much larger the screen is, how much bigger the buttons are, so you can easily access these function buttons, which are some of the most common uh, buttons you're going to be using on, on the instrument, aside, aside from the number pad there. And now one of the things they have chosen to do is that they have the screen is actually recessed, it's not flush with the instrument, which is, which is both good and ma bad in my view. It's good because it protects the screen. If it falls on its surface, you're going to have uh, some freedom there to, for stuff not to hit the screen there. But uh, you can see, for example, in the 199C, there is a protective layer on top of it. Now, it's easy to do that here because this is not a touch screen, but this one is uh, quite a bit more difficult. Um, now, the good thing about it is, as I mentioned, is, is protection, but also debris can get caught in these edges when you're outside. It might be a little bit difficult to clean, but really I'm nitpicking because it's just so well designed. I really can't find many uh, problems with it. Now, if you look here on the side here, obviously this strap is for you to be able to hold it like this, and this can be moved from the left to the right side of the unit so that you can hold it with your left or right hand. And it's, you know, as I told you, it's not that heavy, but of course this has got the battery and everything inside of it. It's reasonably weighted for what it can do. Uh, on the side here, we have the 15 volt DC input to charge the battery, and then once you take this off, one of the little details that I like is that there's a bit of freedom to it, so you can see it has a bit of a free pl plastic that, that goes inside the unit and allows it not to break down so easily so that you don't put too much torque on it and it's got a bit of freedom there that's nice and it of course completely uh, seals and, and shields it. On top of the instrument here, uh, you can see everything again also completely shielded and sealed. Uh, even the USB connectors, you can see that they have gone through the trouble of having an extra piece of plastic that goes inside the port there to further protect it. I've always really not liked the kind of uh, connector protectors that go around the metal body of the connector too because those are really hard to get off. But these ones don't do that and they only basically just go on the inside of the connector itself assuming that the connector body uh, and the connector to the chassis is fully sealed itself. So it gives you a little bit of an advantage of easily being able to take them off and then putting them back on. So that's also a nice thing that you can easily do that with the gloves, otherwise it's impossible to get those off and, uh, and also for the headphone jack. Similarly, you have that there. So no complaints there. If I were to uh, really complain, well, one thing on the side here is that 
on this side is where we have the Ethernet as well as the USB port. Now I would expect this compartment to be opened also in this way, just like the DC input was, but unfortunately it opens in this direction. And the reason I don't like that is because once you put a cable in here, this, is, this thing has, has to kind of stick out like that. And you're gonna put a lot of torque and a lot of uh, pressure on this part, and eventually I'm afraid this might fail. Now I don't know how many times you're gonna have to do this before this fails, but it would have been nice if this opened in this direction as well. But again, like I said, I'm really, really nitpicking here uh, to find problems with it. At the back there, we have obviously the two screws for the battery access, and then we have the kickstand, which is really hard to take off. So I don't know how many times this is going to um, be a problem, but maybe it's just my unit that's a little bit difficult, but it really locks in place. So it's, again, it's both good and bad. If you put your nail in there a little bit, then you can get it off, so you don't have to just snap it off each time. But I've done it a couple of times so far without any issue. It locks in quite well, very nice there. So this is going to stand solid on your desk, for example. So very nice, very, very happy with its design. I have to say, everybody who walks into the lab is one of the very first things they ask, like, what is that? It's just so stands out from everything else. Great design, very good engineering, as to be expected from the Germans. Uh, Roden Schwartz really, really knows what they're doing. So I'm excited to turn it on and see what we can do with it. All right, let's turn it on, see how long it takes for it to be up and running. Now I would expect portable instruments particularly to be quick because you don't want to turn them on and wait for a long time for them to boot up. So and Roden Schwartz is generally pretty good with that. So let's see how long it takes. It's been a couple of seconds already. It says booting, please wait. And you can see this is the five kilohertz to four gigahertz version. There it is, 90% uh, loaded. And there we are up and running. So it doesn't take long at all. It's already ready to use. Of course, it may take a bit more time if you want really precise up to temperature calibrated measurement. But generally for these things, you want to be up and running on the field anyway. And this is a fantastic, pretty quick um, turnaround time to be up and running. And for, in terms of the GUI, very familiar. If you've ever used Roden Schwartz instruments, you would be able to dive right in. And since this is the first time I'm reviewing a Roden Schwartz instrument here on the channel, I thought we would take a, just a few minutes to take a look at some of the GUI features before we jump into actual experiments. And by the way, the viewing angle on this is very, very good. So when portable applications, walking around, looking at it on an angle with a couple of people trying to figure out a problem on the field, not going to have any issues with that. So as a starting point, I have the FPH connected directly to the Azure and EXG, which has a very good phase noise, and this would allow us to explore some of the simple functionalities of the FPH and the behavior of its GUI. All right, let's take a look at the instrument's GUI interface. Then I'm going to preset to get everything back to this default setting. Now, before I start, if you remember when I was reviewing the Keysight MXA, I mentioned how some of these GUI features resemble the Roden Shorts, and that's no accident because Roden Shorts are basically the pioneer of some of those styles of doing things, the multi-tab measurements, as well as the signal flow abstract diagrams are Roden Shorts uh, classic designs. And it's, I really like that style of doing things. It's, it's so designed for engineers. It's, it's so classic German style of doing things very clear, very concise, and precise way of showing information. And uh, this, of course, benefits from some of those characteristics as well, as I will show you. Now, on the right side here, we have some of the vertical information there, uh, the reference level, preamplifier, attenuation, and so on. And you can turn things on and off by simply tapping them. Let's say I want to turn on the preamplifier. I can just tap on it, and the preamplifier will be turned on. And you can see that the diff display average noise level changes because the input attenuation will automatically jump to uh, 10 dB. Let's go ahead and turn that back off there. And if you want to access that a signal flow diagram there, you just tap on that little block diagram in the corner, and there it is. This is what I was talking about, one of the uh, famous ways of doing things for the road and Schwarz. Here you can see a very clear flow of signal as it is processed by the instrument from the input all the way to the type of analysis that's done on the waveform, how the trigger is configured is all in one window. And if you want to change something, no problem, you just tap on it and then you can go ahead and change any of that right there on the fly. And this is very handy, especially on the field if you want to quickly find out what's going on. Now the soft menus at the bottom are obviously accessible by either touching them or with the function keys and naturally you're going to be using the function keys for that. So instrument setup, for example, can can be displayed this way. Now this is probably the only place in the GUI where there is a bit of lag. So if I were to try and scroll here, you can see a little bit of lag between where I'm scrolling and when the display is changing. Perhaps this is something that can be improved in the firmware or it's just simply the limitation of the processing 
power of the instrument because I believe it's doing things in the background right now and that's probably why it's a little bit slow now this menu is not something you're accessing all the time anyway it's one of those things you kind of set up once and then you leave so it's not really that big of a deal same with the user preference and once you're in that menu uh, you have some of the basic information like the owner of the instrument and what library where the files are being saved and how the preset key behaves and this type of information again is something that um, you would only change once like the what kind of how the save events are taken care of how the capture event is these are useful of course for field use because you want to set them once depending on how you're going to capture measurement a lot of people who are going to use these things are are people who are capturing data a very critical data for some field trial or some problem or some diagnostic and they need to have very clear reporting of how this information is collected and this is designed specifically for that it even has a wizard button that directly takes you to a, a, a wizard on how to collect this information so that everybody on your team has exactly the same report style. This can be really handy in a big company when there is you know, 50 of these and everybody has one all around the world and they're trying to capture data. So they've really thought about that, both in the hardware and in the software. And you can also look at the hardware information, you know, installed options and so on. So these are not menus you would normally access very often. So let's go back over here now that we have set up our instrument to the just the default setting there. And let's go ahead and enable the EXG. Now, when this instrument powers on, under preset, you can see that the reference is set to minus 20 dBm. And it's quite low because this is typically going to be used with antennas out, outdoors. So the signal levels coming in are going to be naturally low. Now, I have set the EXG to 2 gigahertz and I've set it to 0 dBm, which is well above the reference level of this instrument. And let's see how it handles that. So I'm going to go and turn it on. And you can see that as soon as I turn it on, we have an IF overload and a beep warning telling us that the signal is above the reference level and therefore the measurement is inaccurate. And it's going to continue doing this beeping. This is again handy in the field. If this happens, let's go ahead and turn this off so it doesn't annoy us. And let's go and change the reference level. So I can go ahead, tap on the reference there and enter a new value. Let's go ahead and enter 0 dBm. Pretty straightforward there. Then we can go ahead and turn it on and there is our tone right there in the middle of the screen at 2 gigahertz there because remember we're going all the way up to two, 4 gigahertz here. Now this instrument actually doesn't have a button that I use all the time in other spectrum analyzers and that's peak search. Normally a peak search will create a marker and put you at the peak of that marker but they have opted to use some of the other buttons more suitable for field use. It really doesn't matter because I've thought of that. In fact if you go and press the marker button the first marker it makes will automatically be a peak search marker. So it's um, automatically putting it for me at the point where the, the tone is. So they've kind of handled that uh, elegantly there in the background. So we see that we are reading 2 gigahertz and the power is minus 0.2 dBm, which is quite accurate. There is a bit, little bit of loss in the cable and the power of that EXG is very, very accurate. So it's quite nice and everything looks very good. Now I can go ahead and zoom in and out of this waveform by using multi-touch for example. I can go ahead and do this and you can see that I'm zooming into the waveform. Now there's one thing I wish they were doing and that was to give some visual feedback that indeed you're stretching the waveform or that you're compressing it by just showing the waveform move as I am doing this action. But it doesn't do anything until I let go. It's a little minor criticism and it should be easily fixable in the firmware. But really I don't think most people would really use multi-touch to, to zoom into the waveform anyway because if you're holding it with one hand and you'd have to use this finger, it's just much easier to enter the values. And let's go ahead and do that. So under frequency, I can set the start frequency there, let's say to 1.995 gigahertz. And I set the stop frequency to 2.00. Uh, 5 gigahertz there. There it is. You can see our waveform there. We can go ahead and change the resolution band. Let's change the resolution band with there to 10 kilohertz to get a better view there. And you can see on a 10 kilohertz resolution bandwidth and a 10 megahertz span, our sweep time is now 663 milliseconds, which is okay. It's reasonable. It's not too bad for an instrument like this. And now we can go also change the way the signal is handled by the instrument. If you want to see a nice average uh, signal so you can get a good idea of the phase noise, we can go ahead here on the signal flow and under the analysis there we can change the type of detector we're using so let's say from auto peak let's just choose an rms detector and let's do some trace averaging on top of that and go back to our waveform there and there it is you can clearly see the shape and the 
the skirts of the phase noise of the of the instrument because as I mentioned the EXG is very clean it's a full uh, blown instrument of course and it's going to have a much cleaner phase noise um, than this instrument and you can clearly see the the shape of the phase noise there and the average is now complete 10 out of 10 average you can change all that so it's really straightforward now in order for you to get some relative measurements, typically you would want to have more than one marker. Now you can go under the marker menu and, and add markers, or you can just go ahead and uh, double tap, and by double tapping, it'll give you another marker. And the next marker it gives you is going to be a delta marker by default. And so they've thought about this uh, to, to kind of kind of guide you in the most typical ways you'd be using the markers. So that mark, the first marker be sitting at the, at the main frequency, that our main tone, and the second one is now showing, it, showing a difference. Now I could select this marker by finger and move it around. And as I move it around, I'm going to get a live delta view, which is this, and also a vertical difference, which is that number over there. So this is going to do that. Now I have a little bit of a difficulty letting go of that marker and then having it stay where it's supposed to. It kind of always jumps back and it's hard to catch it, especially. See, now I've caught the waveform instead of the, the marker there. So if I let go of that, I can try and catch this one. So I don't know how many people would actually use uh, their fingers to try and move this, but I guess you could. Uh, but if you miss it a little bit, then you're going to end up moving the waveform, but then everything moves together, which is not a big deal. You lose your average in this case. But anyway, these are really minor points. But yeah, it kind of works. But when I let go, it jumps back. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Maybe a little minor issue with the firmware that they can fix, or maybe this is something on purpose that I'm missing. But I generally can get it to stay exactly where I want it always jumps back a little bit or you could just go under the marker menu and on there you can select the marker that you're interested in and you can choose jump back and forth between the markers very very quickly there which is great you can change the type of the marker you have whether it's a delta marker and by pressing it you can change it between a delta and another marker so it's actually really quick to manipulate the information on the screen by using these buttons. You don't really need to be able to drag the markers around. It's just a feature they have because they have a multi-touch screen anyway. And sometimes it can be handy. If you have multiple tones and you want to quickly look around, then this panning is very good. And we will see this. I have an experiment specifically that's going to take advantage of a whole bunch of these things. But I just wanted to show you some of the, the way it behaves here. And then you can just delete all the markers. For example, you can delete the selected marker, or you can just say delete all. So it, they kind of know what they're doing with regards to that, so I appreciate that. Now, if I go and preset this, you're going to get the beeping again because the reference is going to be at minus 20 dBm. So they just wanted to give you a very quick idea of how this behaves and be doing some basic measurements. But really, what you want to know is how it behaves when you have some unknown situation where some things are, are not very clear as opposed to just a single tone. So I have a setup for that. Let me go ahead and prepare that. We can take a look at it. All right, now what I've done is I've connected an antenna directly to the input of the spectrum analyzer, and I am broadcasting some mystery signals around the lab from various locations, and we want to analyze and understand what these signals are and what their properties are, and we want to see how easy it is to do that directly on the FPH. And along the way, we'll learn how it performs as well as some of its limitations. All right, and let's take a look and see what's going on here. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of activity here in the spectrum. And this is to be expected because besides the tones that I'm broadcasting on purpose, there are quite a few other intermittent signals due to Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Bluetooth, and a whole bunch of other things that are happening here in my house, as well as the fact that my LED lights are putting out quite a bit of noise. And you can see some of that noise on the left side of the screen there, I saw it, along with AM and FM radios and a whole bunch of other stuff. But nonetheless, the signals that we are interested in seeing are the largest ones here on the spectrum. So let's go and take a look and discover their mysteries and see what's going on with them. So let's start with the largest one. That seems to be a logical way. And let's see how we can do that. So I'm pressing marker there. Now marker is going to jump to the peak. And you can see that the signal is around 2.1, 2.19, 2.2 gigahertz. Now I want to look closely at it. Well, I can, under the marker function, aside from uh, creating peaks and finding the next peaks and so on, I can also center it the instrument at the marker. It's a very common function for markers. All spectrum analyzers do this. And I can go ahead and, and reduce the span. Let's go really close and let's go look at a span of, let's say, 10 megahertz. And there it is. And take a look. There's more to that tone than it seemed from far away. And I can go ahead and maybe center it a little bit better over here. And you can see that there is indeed two tones to that signal. And you can see also intermodulation products. Now the resolution map is too high there. Let's go ahead 
bruise the rotary knob to reduce the resolution bandwidth based on the uh, predetermined steps. And again, this is also a common phenomenon. There, so there it is. You can see at the 30 kilohertz resolution bandwidth in a span of 10 megahertz, the sweep time is 56 milliseconds, which is reasonable. Now, once you go below that, then it's an order of magnitude slower. It becomes 663 milliseconds. So there we go. Now we can clearly see some of the properties of this signal. First of all, it's two tones. And you can see the intermodulation products. You can even see more intermodulation products just outside of the uh, reach of the noise there. And we want to measure how good the intermodulation products are. Now, remember, we cannot measure OIP3 because we don't know the loss of the channel. In fact, if I move my hand around, the antenna, you can clearly see that I can create nulls and I can fade the signal in and out because some of it is going to be absorbed by my hand. Also, if I touch the antenna, I can change the impedance of the antenna and so on. Now, you can see that intermodulation tones go down at the same rate as the fundamental tone because, again, this is a linear effect and the channel bandwidth is fairly constant within this range so that we don't have a different frequency response there. So these are all expected and interesting results. Now I'm going to go ahead and carry this, um, in fact, I'm going to go on the marker and I'm going to set the marker here to the peak. So that's going to jump to the, our main tone there. You can see our main tone is at 2.201 gigahertz. And I'm going to create another marker. Uh, let's sort of put another marker right here. And in fact, I just happened to hit it perfectly. So now you can see that it's sitting at 4 megahertz away from this tone, which means that our two tones are 2 megahertz apart and our intermodulation products are therefore sitting that much further away. And here you can clearly see that our intermodulation tone is 48 dB below the fundamental measurement, which is minus 22 dBm. That's why this is in dB and that one's in dBm. So we know now that our intermodulation products are 48 dB lower than our fundamental from our transmitter, which is pretty reasonable because my transmitter here is the EXG and it's putting out 20 dBm. So it's doing actually a pretty good job with the intermodulation products. I can go ahead and reduce the amplitude of my transmitted signal and you can see that the intermodulation products fade much faster, again, as to be expected. So the behavior of this system is exactly as you would want. Every dB that I reduce the power, I get 3 dB of improvement in inter intermodulation products. So this is a, a, a classic example of a two-tone transmitter for measuring its linearity. And it seems to have no problem. You can see how easy it is to jump between this and analyze those. Now, a little earlier in the video, I was talking about the difficulty associated with placing a marker, and I understand why. So if you select a marker and you move it around, when you let go of it, it's going to jump around a little bit. The reason is because it's looking for a peak. So if I move this closer to this peak and I let go, it will snap onto it. And this is a very logical behavior for a marker, because this is most of the time basically what you're trying to do. But if I want to place it somewhere in the middle, it's going to be a little difficult in this because of this function that's built into it. Now, I'm not sure if I can turn it off anywhere, but not that I understand it, I quite like it. Now, if you want to move it otherwise, well, you can use a rotary knob uh, to place it anywhere you want, and this has acceleration built into it, so you can move around pretty quickly, or you can, of course, just simply enter the value you want. Let's say, in this case, I want 2.2 gigahertz where the marker is. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is because I want to investigate the noise floor behavior of this system. Now, the noise that you see there is actually made of multiple parts. It's the noise of the instrument itself. And on top of that, there is the possible noise figure or the uh, phase noise of the transmitter coming from the EXG. So the phase noise of the transmitter, which is in the skirts of the main tones, are going to be sitting on top of the noise of the instrument. And if they are dominant, they're going to raise the noise. Now, it's easy to do this in two ways. Well, here I can just move my hand around the antenna, and you can clearly see how the noise floor also moves up and down, which means that the bigger portion of the noise that you see here is the received noise from the EXG. Now I can verify this in another way. I can go under my marker and I can go under marker function and I can enable noise. Now as soon as I do that, the instrument will automatically change the detector type and it's going to now return to me the noise in dBm per hertz. So that's the noise it's seeing at a 2.2 gigahertz frequency is minus 135 dBm per hertz and I want to see if it's because of the EXG but well, I can go ahead and turn off the EXG. There it is. When I turn it off, now you can clearly see that the noise is now minus 145 dBm per hertz, which is significantly lower, so the noise is dominated by the phase noise of the transmitter in this case. Now, don't mistake that noise is not going to go down if you change the resolution bandwidth. This has nothing to do with that because it's taken into account already when you return an absolute value like dBm per hertz in this case. And I can go ahead and turn this back on. And you can see that the noise indeed goes back up, so there's a contribution from the EXG. Now I can also go ahead and turn this back off again, which will then solve, go back to the original configuration. And if I want to know an exact frequency there, I can just take that and let go, and it will snap to the peak there. And let's go ahead and reduce the resolution bandwidth just a little bit. 
let's say resolution back on, onto three hertz there. And if I go under marker, and you can do another peak search if you really want to. I mean, it's not going to make a difference. And you can go under marker function again. And you can now turn on frequency count. And it's going to give you a very accurate representation of that frequency there. Now, any offset from what it's supposed to be compared to what's coming from there is going to be uh, the difference between the reference clock of this instrument and the reference clock of the EXG. And remember that this guy can accept. Uh, an external reference directly to the input. So that's another way of adjusting its absolute reference. And one last thing here is now that I have reduced the resolution bandwidth, you can see another tone there in the middle. So I know you guys like puzzles. I'm going to let you guess why that tone is there. And now we can move on to the next mysterious tone. OK, now we can take a look at some of the other mysterious tones there. Let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit more this time. So we're going to start from a frequency of 2 gigahertz and stop at a frequency of, let's say, 2.5 gigahertz. Now we can see our three tones. This tone is the one we've already examined clearly. This other tone is the one we want to look at. And there's a whole bunch of stuff going on over there. We'll take a look at that last. Now I can go ahead and enable my marker again, which is going to take that peak. Now I'm going to move the marker and let go. And it's going to pick up that one for me. And under marker, I can set the marker to the be the center frequency, and now I can go ahead and reduce the span. Let's say I'm going to look at the span of, let's say, 50 megahertz. Now, at the span of 50 megahertz, you can see that the marker isn't exactly on top of the tone. This is to be expected because we were looking at it from very, very far away. Now, I can go ahead and change the set the marker once again to be uh, to the peak, and also set it to be the center frequency again. So you can see now the fre center frequency is very close to 2.3 gigahertz. We can even go ahead and type that in. It doesn't really matter. 2.3 gigahertz is our center. There it is. Now you can see our tone. Now I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. We're going to see some interesting behavior from this signal. Let's look at it from a 10 megahertz span there. And if you look carefully, it kind of looks like it's moving around a little bit, doesn't it? There it is. So what's going on with it? Now, before I tell you, maybe you can take a guess and why, why it is doing this weird dancing around. Now, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in even more. Now, we're going to set our span to 1 megahertz. There you go. Now, you can really see this weird thing that it's doing. So now you can take a guess at what's going on there. Well, if you've seen any of this, it will be very obvious. Let's go ahead and reduce the bandwidth a little bit more. Now, we're at 30 kilohertz resolution bandwidth. Now, as soon as I begin to change it, it becomes more and more clear what we're, what we're looking at there. Now, we're going to go ahead and reduce the span even further. Let's look at the span of 100 kilohertz. And now you can see the signal is outside of the screen, so we're going to have to move it in. There it is. Does it look familiar? Well, if you've ever seen these type of signals, you would immediately recognize it. This is an FM modulated signal. And the reason the shape of it changes so much, depending on the resolution bandwidth, is because it has to do with how the spectrum is sampled. Now, if I had an infinitely fast instrument, I would actually be able to see the tone moving back and forth because it's FM modulated. But because it's continuously moving back and forth and it's not synced with the sampling of the instrument itself, you're going to get this behavior. So as I change the resolution bandwidth, you're going to get more and more of the signal being displayed. Now, if I go really low, you can see the individual tones as the instrument captures them as it is moving back and forth, which is pretty interesting to observe. Now, now that I see this and I know that it's an FM modulated signal, I can do some more analysis on it. So let's go under the uh, frequency range again, and let's increase the range from 100 kilohertz, let's say, to 500 kilohertz. So we're looking at it a little bit farther away. And now I can go under my marker. And I can go under my marker function, and I can actually turn on demodulation, because this instrument does internal AM and FM demodulation. Let's go ahead and change the time of the demodulation to, let's say, one second. And let's go ahead and turn it on. Oop, I think I missed that. There it is. Can you hear it? It is demodulating the FM signal, and it's putting it out as audio with the built-in speaker. And you can hear that it's a constant tone. And this constant tone means that the FM modulation is being done with a constant FM frequency. Now that we have this information, I'm going to go ahead and turn this off for a second before it drives us crazy. And then we can go and do a deep analysis on it, because this instrument has built-in uh, extensive AM and FM demodulation capabilities. And we can do this simply by changing the mode of the instrument. So if I go under mode, and if I go under analog demod, 
I will get the analog demodulation window. Here I've already completely set it up for you and I'm looking at the modulation summary. Now if you want to look at it as a function of time also, you can just go under modulation trace and this will then give you a clear view of the demodulation property. So first of all, across time, we can see the FM demodulated signal. The vertical axis here is the FM deviation frequency, so it clearly is, you can see that there is an offset with respect to the carrier and that information can also be read in the modulation summary. And you can see the single tone demodulated signal as we would expect because that's what we were hearing when we did the demodulation through audio. Now if I go back to the modulation summary, every information that I would want with regards to that is also provided here. The carrier frequency is minus nine kilohertz away and that's the difference between the reference of the Roden Schwartz instrument and the Rigel synthesizer I'm using to generate the FM signal. And if I go under the trace, you can see that the trace is not centered around zero because with respect to the carrier frequency of 2.3 gigahertz, we actually have that offset and that's captured in the modulation summary. And you can see that the carrier power received minus 40 dBm is the total amount of power that we're getting. Frequency deviation of 10 kilohertz, that's exactly what I've set it to. And the modulation frequency is one kilohertz, and that's what we were hearing. Now the SYNAT, the signal to noise and distortion ratio, and the total harmonic distortion of the demodulated signal is also shown, which is pretty handy because the combination of these two basically tells you the quality of your signal. And then the THD of about minus 37 dB is pretty reasonable considering uh, how I'm achieving this over here. So you can see all this information pretty readily available. There's a whole bunch of other terms you can change, obviously, the, the amount of low pass filtering, how the audio is handled. I'm not going to go into the details of that. I just want to show you briefly that you can indeed do this quite easily. Now you can also define limits by pressing lines and that limit would mean that you can populate this upper and lower limit. So if you have a standard which is very stringent with regards to how much FM deviation or AM de deviation you may have and how much power can come and go, then you can load that up and then it will give you a, a, a fail status or an audio beep whenever you're failing those limits. And this is very handy in the field as you're doing work and you want to see if there is a failure and get an audio feedback from that. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like I can enter these manually. You can only select them from a predefined file. And there's a, this is a very common thing. This instrument is designed for the field. So you can load a lot of different standards directly onto here. And I'll show you that a little bit later too, that you, know, you can test your signals against. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be able to enter them manually in this window can be that difficult to change the firmware to do that. And I would recommend that because for a lot of times you may not have it ready and just maybe want to enter one or two of these values. It would be pretty uh, useful to have that feature there. And you can then go back to your spectrum and it will preserve the settings of that spectrum so you can jump back and forth pretty easily. Well, now that we have looked at this FM demodulation, let's look at our last mysterious signal and see what that one looks like. All right, here's our last signal there. So let's go ahead and take a look a little bit closer to this area and see what we're looking at there. And there it is. Now this is a signal of interest and you can clearly see there's a whole bunch of other activity going on around it. So what's going on here? Well, it's a little difficult to analyze like this and part of the reason is because this frequency is close to a lot of other frequencies that are present in the lab. So for the purposes of narrowing it down and figuring out what's going on, I'm going to connect the source directly to the spectrum analyzer. Now the source here is an evaluation board sitting on the side of the lab with an antenna pointed towards this instrument. So let's go ahead and connect it directly and then we can take a look closer at what's going on. And here's our tone. We can take a close look at it now. Now even though I've connected it directly from the eval board, every once in a while you can see some occasional activity here. And this is because the eval board is just not shielded enough to protect it from all the packets that are flying around here in the lab. You're going to get that and we have to live with that. But it doesn't matter. For our purposes, we're interested in that tone there. Now that tone looks like to be a CW tone at 2.445312 gigahertz. But in reality it's not. It's not a CW tone. It jumps around every 1.28 seconds and the duration in which it jumps around is very short as at 100 microsecond. Now this instrument is simply not fast enough to capture that reliably. Every once in a while you can see something but you're not sure where it is exactly coming from and this is really the only weakness of this instrument because if this had a real-time analysis window even if it was a sh small one like 20 megahertz it would be a totally different instrument because it would allow you to capture so many more details 
and so much more infrequent events and make it just a, a wonderful machine in the field. Now I realize why they haven't done that because it's a cost issue, it's a comp competition issue with their other models, and maybe it is something that they will add in the future. Obviously it's going to require a hardware change and it will most likely be a new model, but that's really the only criticism. If it had that, it'd just be amazing because it would, could do so much more. But let's see if we can do uh, something about this anyway. So what I can do is I, go, I can go under my trace and I can change my trace mode. And let's go ahead and set the trace mode to be a max hold trace. Now what this will do is that it will build up the spectrum as it sees activities and it will never clear. It's no longer on a clear right. Now if I wait long enough, aha, you see I already caught something. Those two tones that you see there aren't actually two separate tones. It just happens to catch it on its way there and on its way back. It's supposed to jump to around this frequency here. You can see that we don't even know where it is jumping to because you're just capturing it in, in some of its transition every once in a while. Now if I wait long enough, eventually I will see all the tones this way and all the tones this way. And you can see there we go, I just caught two more of them. But this is just a matter of waiting now. And you don't want, obviously, to do that in the field, but if you have to, and if you have to capture something, then this is the way to do it. You can also play with the detector type and, and choose a d different detector. I'm on max peak here, but there are other ways of setting your detector, and it will help you pick up some of these signals. But if you didn't know that this was an intermittent tone, then it would make it very difficult to capture it because you're not expecting it. Here I know where it is, so I know how to work around it. There you go, you just captured a few more of them. But anyway, I just want to talk a little bit about that because it's such a good feature to have and I would have loved to see that and hopefully Roden Shores would listen to this and, and figure out how to add this to their future models. Well there is so much more measurement we can do nonetheless so let's go ahead and take a look and how we can uh, do some basic measurements on a modulated signal. And here it is a little bit longer there you go now you can see the final tone we finally caught it just took about a minute or so but this is the way to go around it if you don't have a full real-time analysis built into the instrument. And here is our modulated signal. This is a QPSK modulation at the same carrier frequency. This is a pretty stable modulation. It's not jumping around, so we can do some measurements on it reliably. So let's go ahead and try and find out how much transmit power we actually have. But we can go under measure, and we can go ahead under channel power. And I've already set this up. I've set the channel to be 5 megahertz at the same carrier frequency. And you can see that it's reporting a total transmit power of minus 10 dBm. And that's the total power in that 5 megahertz bandwidth. Obviously, you can change the 5 megahertz bandwidth. You can move it around anywhere in the spectrum. You can also find the power density of the channel. And you can see the power density of the channel is minus 77 dBm per hertz, which makes sense for a channel that is directly connected uh, to our transmitter there. Now, this is a basic measurement that obviously a lot of spectrum analysts can do. But one of the things that has been the focus of the design of the FPH has been its ability to collect data across many users reliably. For instance, they have built-in standards, so you can select the standard that you want to do this measurement on. And this will configure the instrument with the proper uplink, downlink, a channel bandwidth, frequency center, and everything, so that when you do this measurement based on that standard and other engineers are doing the same thing, all your results will be consistent. In fact, they have a dedicated button called the wizard button, which then allows you to load a test set and collect data within that test set. And then once you have that test set data collected, you can bring it into a report, and that report then can be compared with other engineers in the field and create a bigger report. You can have a team of 20 or 30 people, each of them with one of these in a different part of the field or a different location, which then do the same wizard measurement sequence, and then you can compare them. And this is critical. I can't tell you how important something like this is when you have a big operation, because if you cannot reliably compare the data of various users together because you cannot ensure that they have the same settings, then your measurement is useless. So they have spent a lot of time making sure that that happens, and I really like that. Now if I go back to my measurement here, as I showed you, I can do this simple power measurement. I can also change the mode to a spectrogram. And under the spectrogram, you get this very classic spectrogram look. You can record this spectrogram. You can play it back later. You can change its settings, its, its references, and what the uh, range of the frequency and the range of the amplitude is looking at. All of these are basic measurements which you can easily change. So right now, we can see clearly that this is a stable channel. And of course, if it was moving away too fast, we wouldn't see it, as I discussed before. But for basic measurements, this will definitely do the job. Let's go ahead and change the modulation to a slightly wider bandwidth modulation. And if you look, you can see that once the signal disappears, we get a gap in our spectrogram. And now the new spectrogram is slightly wider because this is a higher modulation bandwidth. But we can very easily do this uh, measurement very quickly. I can also go back and change it to 
a CW tone. And you can see that once this stabilizes, you can see that CW tone has a, has a much higher power density, and therefore it shows up much warmer on that spectrogram plot there. So it's really pretty nice and clear. I can also change the mode to a power meter. So you have a portable pow power meter here directly. And you can see that here in this particular measurement, uh, we're looking at 100 kilohertz bandwidth, and we're seeing a minus 20 dBm transmit power. And the bandwidth is really small. If I go ahead and change the bandwidth, let's say, to 10 megahertz, we can see that we will capture the entire power within that bandwidth. And this is important when you have modulated signals because you can measure the power uh, incorrectly if you don't have the correct bandwidth. And this allows you to set the bandwidth and so on. And it gives you different units and you can set, your, uh, set a new reference so you can do relative measurements. There's a lot of different things you can do here which I can go into details of uh, later. Now one of the things that it does which I cannot show unfortunately right now is this maps function. And this maps function allows you to do measurement, uh, different power measurements at different frequencies and correlate them on a map and then collect that data later and then find out, triangulate them and find out exactly if your power measurements across the map make sense. Obviously, this is not going to work right now because I don't have a GPS signal going on, but I, you can do everything that you did before, but it will perform the location on the map based on the GPS coordinates for you. Again, designed for field use, designed for outdoor use, very important if you, if you want to find out how the power distribution of your network is across the field in different places in the city. You can have fading, which this can capture. If you're walking around, you can capture a fading effect, and it will triangulate that on the map for you. So when you go back, you can look at the data and find out exactly how your network behaves and where the blind spots of the network are. These are multi-million dollar problems, by the way. So it's really important that these instruments can reliably and easily do these things for you. Now, one of the other nice features of this instrument is that it's designed with the eye on having a lot of accessories. There's already a lot of accessories that are compatible with this, and I'm sure there will be a lot more in the future. Because this has USB ports directly at the top there, you can plug in various things which are even active. So there is a set of active EMC probe kits from Roden Schwartz that plug directly into this instrument and gives you a portable EMC probe uh, set, which is awesome, and I would love to get my hand on that in the future because this can easily be my handy uh, troubleshooting tool for my repairs. A lot of times when I repair boards, which are synthesizers or some other signal on them, you have to look around with an EMC probe to find the problem, and that would be awesome to be able to use this right there on the spot. So that's another thing that is, um, would be good to have this in the future. It also comes with a whole bunch of different types of antennas designed, again, for field use. You can look at a brochure. I don't want to go through that because that stuff is readily available for you to see. But go and take a look at them and see all the different kind of accessories that plugs into this. And hopefully, if Roden Schwarz likes that, they'll send me one of those EMC probe sets, and I, I can do another video in one of my repairs and use this exclusively for troubleshooting and finding various signals uh, in an instrument. All right, let's take a look at this Rodenschwarz FPH and see how the construction is. This is a German instrument from Rodenschwarz, so I expect nothing but the best in terms of construction and design, and I'm sure that's, that's what we will get. Now, I've taken all the screws off. The two screws that connect to the battery compartment are metal inserts. Everything else is self-tappers. Not surprising because you don't really open the back of this instrument very often. I've taken the battery out, of course, and the battery RRC is 11.25 volts, 72 watt hours. So it's a fairly large battery. Here it is, you can see the charge indication on it. Nice and easily replaceable if you ever need to change it. I'm going to go ahead and take this off. See what we see. There we go. And uh, it has very classic designs. It's got these inserts that mate with the other side of the unit to create a good seal and good protection against moisture and so on. So these are classic. I'm not going to go into the details of those as to be expected. Now, one of the things that I was talking about before was this piece over here, which fits in this location that, that you open and close. But it looks like it's really easily replaceable in case it ever breaks. So that's a good sign that we can always address that if something goes wrong with it. Now, the construction of the unit itself is very classic because it's got separate boards for different functions. We have a power board there where the battery connects to. There's a few components there. We have to take it further apart to see what's going on. But then there is the main digital board with the processor on it and the RF deck. And there seems to be some other boards underneath because the LCD and the keyboard also need to connect. So we have to take it uh, further up to see what's going on there. But at the heart of this, in terms of processing, is a Zinc Xilinx SOC. Now, this is a programmable SOC. It has an ARM core processor in it. You can actually have up to two cores. And Xilinx claims that they get the, some of the best power numbers for a configurable SOC in the industry. And I believe that. 
And uh, so in this case, you'd have an ARM processor, but you can also program a whole bunch of logic there to do some unique task or very specialized task, which is exactly what a unit like this would be doing. A lot of DSP, signal analysis, and a whole bunch of other things that they would want to do alongside the ARM, which runs the main application running on this unit. So it's pretty normal to see something like that on an instrument of this class. And there's some flash memory there, and there's a TI part, which looks to be a power management IC, which has multiple inputs and outputs, probably can manage several different types of converters there. Some ICs there for the USB and Ethernet, and there is a micro SD card, the speaker there, and interestingly, a port that looks almost like a display port, uh, but it's actually a diagnostic port. I haven't connected anything to it yet, but I'm very curious to see what comes in and out of it. So something that might be worthwhile looking at in a different video. But so far, there's nothing surprising. It's very clean. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing really wrong with it that I can see, at least from this point of view. It looks great. So now we have to take it up a little further, see what's underneath it, so we can learn some of its secrets. And here is the chassis without the main board and the RF deck. And it's very nice and clean, and it has everything you would expect to find on the bottom of the chassis there. We have the main PCB there, which handles all of our power management, charging of the uh, battery, receiving signal through the DC source from the outside. So it really is a quite nice and clean design. There is another TI part there, which is a power management IC. And it's very interesting how this is put together, because the only information that needs to be exchanged between this part of the board and the RF deck and the main board is the information to drive the LCD screen and the information for the keyboard, as well as the power that needs to go to the RF deck part. So that makes sense why everything is handled only through one small connector. All the processing and all the USB and Ethernet and all the generation of the data and processing of data is on the other board and does not need this at all. This means that they can use this uh, chassis for many other applications and don't need to worry about the processing because it's, none of it is basically done on here. It's a nice clean design, a nice clean modular way of building this. Now there's also some ferrite bead around the ribbon cable that goes to the LCD screen and this is because this is a digital interface with a lot of activity, transient activity on it to drive the LCD screen so they want to absorb some of that through the ferrite bead so it doesn't emit inside the instrument. That also makes sense. There is a chip here on the flex which goes to the LCD which, is the, which I believe is the touchscreen controller that goes also to this board which ultimately is handled back to this. So not going to take it apart further than this. Looks very nice and clean, very German design nice custom everything to make sure it fits into the smallest available space built like a tank again nice nice placement of everything in terms of tying it down can't find really a problem with it but all the nice and interesting stuff is on the other board so let's go and take a look and here's the main board the digital and the rf section which have taken the chassis protection off you can see the individual RF compartments here very nicely and obviously the aluminum shield is a custom made part you can see the different compartments there and some of them have strategically RF absorbers on them in order to make sure that there's no internal reflection and no cavities being formed within these uh, little sections there. So this is a very common technique we've seen them uh, all over the place now I've made some observations about the RF front end here I'm just going to go through it very quickly this is a very brief a discussion here is not in detail in order to find out exactly how everything works this requires quite a bit of analysis but the front end starts by two attenuators here now these two attenuators are most likely going to select a zero db path and some fixed attenuation path so they're going to be our main front end attenuator then followed by a chip which is a digital attenuator step attenuator and this actually has a really good input ip3 i was surprised to see so it's not going to have any issue with the linearity limitation of the instrument, especially if the front end attenuator has already been selected. After that is where things become a little bit more interesting. Here we have another RF switch, and this switch is, seems to be selecting between the two frequency bands this instrument is going to be operating. So as with any spectrum analyzer, different frequency bands are handled through different mixers and then eventually reach the final IF stage. So here it seems like one band goes through this nice symmetric filter here, through this mixer and the other band has another mixer on the other side of the board and I'll show you that in a second. After that the RF signals and the LO signals are handled through this portion of the circuit. There's a nice coupler over here, perhaps on the uh, synthesized, uh, synthesizer for the LO section. A few other interesting things, some power management stuff here, but the fact that they have the USB portion here in the RF deck certainly complicates some of the design because this portion has to be very well shielded, this USB connection to the outside. You don't want to have any noise coming in and out because especially you don't always know what's connected to it. So this has to be very well shielded and I'm sure they've done a very good job with that. You can see the reference coming in over here, which is handled by something on the other side of the board and I will show you that 
in just a second as well. Everything else is pretty self-explanatory. On the other side, we have the rest of the RF signal pattern, no pun intended there. And here we can see the other mixture for the other band I was talking about and some other filters and, and couplers and so on. And this component over here is an analog devices, or actually no, I take that back. It's a Texas Instrument 12 or 14 bit, 65 or 125 megasample per second ADC. This is likely the final ADC for the final IF. And this then goes to the zinc Xilinx processor. So you can see the close proximity probably is due to that. Now, if you take a look a little bit more here, uh, what was the other thing I want to talk about? Oh, here it is. This is the a DAC. This is an audio DAC. It's likely used to drive the audio output as well as the speaker in case of the AM and FM modulation. I actually played some music through the AM and FM uh, through the demodulation. I didn't put that in the video for this one. But anyway, it's pretty nice. You can clearly uh, see that it, it works nicely. Now, over here, this section over here where the main uh, 10 megahertz reference is built, is fed into these two ICs. And these two ICs are then uh, going through some other components which then meet the mixers. This means that these are most likely the main synthesizers of this board. And they work together to perform the frequency span and all the other things that this instrument needs to do. But these are both Rodenshaw's branded. So I don't know what the part number is and what is inside of them exactly. I couldn't really find any information. Either Rodenshaw's designed these or branded them. But it's nice to see that there's some definitely some custom parts in there specifically for this instrument. Now over here, there's some empty section. Now it's very obvious what that empty section is. This is obviously for the tracking generator and the built-in synthesizer. A built-in generator that can then you know, be used for measuring loss and so on. But there is nothing there. Even the source screen is there, which means that this definitely cannot be easily hacked to include uh, that synthesizer output there. But I thought it would be a fun project at one point to see if we can figure out the architecture a little bit more and perhaps tap onto it and have our own little output there so we can have a reference generator uh, as well. And for completeness here, let's take a look at Instrument View, which is a software from Roden Schwarz, which can communicate with this particular category of spectrum analyzers. Now here I'm interested to see how responsive this remote interface actually is, because if it is very responsive, either through Ethernet or through USB, then it can be put in a remote location and accessed uh, to do analysis when you're not necessarily near, let's say, a tower or an amplifier or some remote location. So let's go ahead under Instrument here and do a remote display and it should open this up and there it is. Take a look, I mean it's pretty fast, it's responsive, it looks like it's updating almost in real time, so I'm pretty happy with that. Now in this particular case, again, I'm over USB 2.0, not over Ethernet, but I'd imagine that the performance is just as good, if not better, over Ethernet. So let's do some measurements here and see what we get. Now I can set my center frequency, just like I normally would do on the instrument, which is 2.44513 gigahertz. That's going to bring the wave from right in the middle. Let's go ahead and change our span here. And let's look at a 10 megahertz span there. And there it is. You can see we can clearly see our various tones there. And the signal is too large. So I can go ahead and change the amplitude and enter 0 dBm. And that will bring the, the, bring the tone down. So you can see it's very nice and responsive. Let's go ahead and change the resolution bandwidth here. And uh, here I can just uh, use this as if I'm using the rotary knob there. So it's pretty good. I like that. And we can make some markers. And press on the first marker there. It's going to hop to the main tone there. And I can continue creating new markers. Here's another one. And it's going to continue jumping on the next tone and the next tone and so on. So it's very nice and responsive. So that you can clearly see that here we have two uh, spurs that are on our spectrum there. And we can see some intermodulation mixing products, I should say, uh, with the main tone there. And these tones are each 4 megahertz apart from the fundamental. That is D3 is 4 megahertz apart from M1. So you can see how nice and responsive it is. Again, it has all the different features and buttons that you would expect from the remote interface and you could use it here on the computer without an issue as if you're basically using the instrument. So I'm pretty happy with that. They've done a really good job with this remote interface. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the review of the FPH Spectrum Analyzer. I really like the unit. It has, like I said, a few minor shortcomings. Hopefully in the future they will address that. But I'm eager to get my hands on some of the more advanced versions of this instrument, especially if they upgrade the look and the feel of it so that they have a cohesive uh, look across all of their portable spectrum analyzers. So this is a really exciting line of instruments from Roden Shores, and they have also a bunch of other stuff coming out. I'm hoping to get my hands on those and review it for you. Now, if you like this video and if you'd like to support my channel, Patreon is one way to do that. You can also leave a comment, like the video as always. 
But if you'd like to see more uh, equipment reviews, the best way to support me is to just let the vendors know that you like my review and that you count on these reviews to get informed about their products. I don't get any portion of the sales of any instruments from any vendors, but this would allow me to have a good relationship with them because it will tell them that you count on these reviews. So far, I've reviewed almost a few million dollars worth of instruments on my channel alone. Of course, some of those were very expensive, like the one million dollar oscilloscope from LaCroix or the half a million dollar oscilloscope from Keysight. But there's a lot of interesting stuff coming out all the time and I would love to show it to you guys. This is one of the channels that I think has this unique opportunity to get some of the expensive instruments in that you would normally never come across. And I hope that Rodan Schwarz is also going to be part of that. So, I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.